Hey everyone, Melissa here. Welcome back to my channel. I am so glad that you are here. I wanted to do a recent reads video for you today, give you a little taste of what I have been reading over the past couple of weeks. So let's get started. Um, the first book that I have to tell, tell you about is Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death. This one was absolutely amazing. I loved this book. This is definitely a five-star read for me, and it's going to be one that is on my favorite books of 2022 list. I thought this was incredible. Um, Selena Gordon Godin, uh, is a author who's brand new to me. I haven't read any of her work before, and hadn't really heard of her um, until this book, which I first saw on Simon Savage's channel, which I will link down below. Um, Simon is a phenomenal booktuber. Everybody knows Simon, and he has great taste in books. Our tastes align really well, and um, I saw him talk and rave about Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death, and thought I would try pick it up. Anyway, um, Selena Gordon, Godin, oh, I can't, why do I keep wanting to say Gordon? Selena Godin is a poet, essayist, advocate. She's a performance artist. Um, she does a, a lot of, you know, great things. And uh, she is based on in original London. books she that I've ever author, read. And so she is the of Jamaican heritage. idea is, um, is that Mrs. This Death, book isn't is really who we one think of the it, most it death is. unique you know and we think of death as the grim reaper um we think of death as a male figure but in this book mrs death is a working class black woman um the type of person as she says in as she writes that we normally don't pay much attention to we don't um notice in our everyday work uh, our everyday lives and uh, so it's a she's the sort of woman that you ignore and so in the book in the novel she takes kind of different forms um to kind of illustrate that point um but you know mrs death has been at this for a while and she's you know since the beginning of eternity and she's getting a little tired and she wants to have somebody write her memoirs and so she connects with wolf williford and he is a um struggling author he is um an orphan his mother died in a large fire which from the description in the book it's very reminiscent of the grenville grenville fell fire in in Britain and so he winds up interacting with Mrs. Death and gets a desk to transcribe her memoirs and from there they kind of revisit different deaths that have happened um, throughout time. Um, the writing is gorgeous, it's poetic, um, which you would expect from somebody of a poet of you know, Selena Godin's caliber and, um, you know, her, her lover is time. Her sister is life. Um, I just, it, I just loved everything about this book. Um, some of the chapters are poems in themselves and, um, yeah. And I also, it also incorporates real life events. Like I said about the Grenfell fire and, um, other things. I think that um, one of the things that I really wanted to point out about this is the last, um, the end pages, not quite the end pages, but the last few pages of the book. Um, it says, we end this book with a silent salute and leave six blank pages. We leave these pages blank as a silent memorial for all the names we do not know and cannot say, for all the invisible, the undervalued, the unmarked, and the unresolved, for all that is becoming extinct, a blank page for the bleached coral reef, depleted rainforest, dead rivers, and obsolete wildlife, the last elephant. We leave these pages blank for all we are losing and have lost to the coronavirus pandemic, to all drowned souls in unmarked watery graves. These empty pages are a salute to all the murdered, 
the disappeared, the stolen, and the erased, the fallen and the pushed. May their light be remembered here. In the beginning of the work, in the disclaimer, Wolf Williford wrote, this book does not mention every person that has ever died. If you wish this book to have mentioned another death or um, we can only apologize now in advance for not knowing which death you wanted celebrated in this book. Um, together, you and I can address this now. I asked you to write the name that came to your mind as you read this story. And it goes on to say to add your love one's name and um, a memory or a prayer or something. I just thought that that was just such a great concept for a novel. I have never really seen anything like that in uh, literature. So again, Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death it is a five-star read for me. Again, it will be one of my favorites of this year and I will read anything that uh, Selena Godin writes again. Um, I, I think that she is going to be a new favorite author of mine. I know she is and, um, highly, highly recommend it. Loved it. Okay. And then we move on to another, um, UK author, Marriageology, The Art and Science of Staying Together by Belinda Luscombe. I like books about relationships and about, um, you know, strengthening your relationships or the dynamics of them. And so this is a book that, you know, back in my book reviewer days, um, I stopped freelance book reviewing um, in about 2019 or so in, in November 2019. And I still have a ton of arcs um, laying around that I still kind of wanted to get to. This is one of them. Um, so I listened to this actually on audio. Um, and I think that it worked really well on audio. Belinda Luscombe um, narrates the, the book herself. Um, she is a journalist for Time Magazine. At least she was at the time when the book was written, and I think this was published in 2019. Um, yeah, it was because that's when I would have gotten it for review. So, um, so she reports on relationships for, for Time Magazine. Um, so, um, the structure of the book is, um, what she calls, it's kind of gimmicky, but it kind of works, uh, is the six F words um, that are issues within uh, marriages, familiarity, fighting, finances, family, fooling around and finding help. So each chapter is devoted to each one of those um, aspects of a marriage or issues that could come up. Um, she includes anecdotes from her own marriage throughout the book. And I guess I would also say that is probably one of my um, slight criticisms of this is that not that we get too many of them, but we hear um, repeatedly that her husband is an architect um, throughout each chapter. Like that's mentioned, you know, when you're married to an architect or, you know, if you've ever lived with an architect and that gets a little bit repetitive at times. So yeah, um, you know, but otherwise it's very witty. It is not quite, it's not really a self-help book. It's just a kind of like, here's what I've learned after being married for such a long time and what, you know, would be helpful in going into a marriage and sustaining a marriage. And, um, it's not for somebody who is a newlywed or brand new. It is really for, um, you know, a couple or somebody who is at the, like in the middle, you know, years or so. So anyway, um, Marriageology, The Art and Science of Staying Together. Um, then I, uh, another audio book that I listened to was The Glass Universe by Dava Sobel. Um, she is a science journalist, a science writer, and it definitely shows in this book. Um, so in, it's about about a group of women who in the mid 19th century worked as computers for the Harvard College, um, was Harvard College then, um, uh, observatory. So they took, um, the measures of the stars and they observed them and they 
figured out like what the book, what the, um, what they were made of and, you know, all kinds of different scientific discoveries and, um, yeah. And they amassed a, an immense body of work, these women and, and some of their names um, were Wilhelmina Fleming, Annie Jump Cannon, uh, Dr. Cecilia Helena Payne. Um, and these are, at least in my view, um, as someone who is not like that familiar with the astronomy field, um, you know, these are not women who, who are, I, I feel are household names, right? So um, it, this book really illuminates what they, you can kind of see my cat Elsa, uh, our cat Elsa in the background there. Um, so it really kind of illuminates like their lives and the contributions that they made to, to um, science. And so this one is, um, I'm just looking at my notes here. So, so what they did, what the women did in, um, in, in their jobs at, at Harvard was that they, you know, they were computers, they were, you know, measuring the stars, like I said, and they, they also used specialized telescopes to photograph the stars and, um, the photographs were on glass plates and hence that's the name, that's what, um, is referenced by the title, the glass universe, uh, it is also kind of a, a, a reference to the glass ceiling because in this environment they had um, male bosses and one one in particular, um, you know, Edward Pickering, and he, you know, championed the women, gave them opportunities, promoted them. This is not the norm of what we are used to seeing in you know the late nineteenth century. So. Um, you know, and also, you know, the other important part about this book is that, so it started, um, it, this work was all funded by a woman philanthropist named uh, Anna Palmer Draper. And her husband, Henry Draper, had died, um, you know, rather, you know, young. And he was, um, you know, he had made great, contributions to science and uh, I think it had like several telescopes and he had uh, an, a small observatory of hers of, of his own and she wanted to find a way to kind of keep that work going and keep his legacy alive and so what she did was she wanted to I want to adjust the this a little sorry um, this a little bit so what she did was um, she originally was going to continue his work herself, but she would have had to hire assistants and she has kind of a scientific background, but she didn't really, um, she, she didn't really, you know, I, I think want to do that anyway. So she was approached by Harvard, um, you know, in, in connection with her husband's work. And so she was approached by them to, kind of fund the work of the observatory and to have, you know, this team of women do do the work. And she funded it for 20 years, which is incredible to me. I mean, it is like, you know, and, and it was at significant sums, um, like $400 a month or $500 a month or, you know, $5,000 a year. And so you have to remember, like, this is like the late 1800s that this was happening. And, you know, that's a significant amount of money. And also there was another philanthropist as well. Um, I forget her name, was it Catherine uh, Bruce, who also donated like equipment and telescopes um, to the observatory. Um, and if you are in fundraising as I am, it's really interesting to see the stewardship that happened with the philanthropist and the um, the observatory with the director. You know, he t he talks about like writing her letters, giving her updates on things, and like that's you know great donor stewardship even back then. Um, so this was a this is a period that I really didn't know much about. I would recommend this for people who liked hidden figures, which this kind of really reminded me of. 
one major criticism I have of this is that the scientific parts of this are really dense. They are not really, it, it's not, the parts about the women and their lives and their work and their interactions with each other and the direct with, you know, the, the observatory and all of that, um, it, that that's great. I, I really enjoyed that part of it. But what is a little bit hard to follow is the actual science of this, um, you know, of their work, right? So, I mean, so that, that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, and other reviewers on Goodreads have said that as well, that it is a little bit dense and a little bit technical. Um, so for that, I'm giving it four stars. Um, otherwise, it, I thought it was really you know, incredible. So let me see if you could see the cover, like you could kind of see, you know, the women at work and, with the the dollar sticker i have no idea where i bought this probably a book sale somewhere um but yeah well worth the dollar that, that i paid for it and finally this book doesn't really have a cover um it is from the library where my daughter uh attends college but it is the violent barrett away by flannery o'connor i absolutely love flannery o'connor i fell in love with her work um in college when i took a course called um Faulkner, O'Connor, and Morrison. So we read the works of William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, and Toni Morrison, and it was a phenomenal class. And you know, if if for anything, it introduced me to Flannery O'Connor. Um, but I had you know up until now, I had never read her second novel um, that that she had published. Her first uh, novel was uh, Wise Blood. I read that wasn't too crazy about it uh, for reasons I can't quite remember but um you know she is just an absolute I keep forgetting to hold up the book um she is an absolute master of this of southern gothic um southern gothic fiction and um so this one was published in um 1960 and it's a story of Francis Marion Tarwater, and he goes by Tarwater. He's 14 years old, he's an orphan, and he lives with his uncle, who was a prophet. And, you know, again, if you know anything about Flannery O'Connor, you know that the religious elements are, like, big. I mean, they are prevalent, they are very much a part of her work. So she, um, so he lives with his uncle. He's a prophet. He's an older man. He dies and he dies at the breakfast table and he wants, um, them to, he, his wishes are that Tarwater, um, baptizes it, his nephew. Um, so there is another family relative and he is a school teacher. His name is Raber and he is, um, he, you know, he, he lives like, you know, some ways away. And so they go, um, you know, and so the, the guy dies. So the uncle dies and Tarwater has to bury him, um, six feet under and dig a hole in the backyard to bury him in. And he decides that's a little bit too much work and he sets the house on fire and then he leaves, travels to the uncle's house. So, he does that and there is a young child, um, the, the, and I keep referring to this other guy as an uncle. He's not, I think he's a, he's more of a cousin. The family relations are a little kind of sketchy, I guess. But, um, anyway, so the guy is a school teacher. He has a son who has some disabilities. Um, it's not really mentioned then what it is. But it is, I'm just looking, my, my son is sending me some texts about um, this legislation that the Republicans are not passing um, for the veterans coverage. Anyway, um, you can see I'm wearing a, my political statement shirt for John Fetterman, for, who is running for Senate here in Pennsylvania. It's a seat that we obviously need to keep Democratic. Um, so anyway, I digress. Um, so they go to the house and there was the son with, with disabilities and Tarwater feels like 
it, he, he, he believes that it's his mission to baptize this child. And he like attempts to do that several times, like takes him out on the boat and, you know, tries to baptize him or, you know, whatever. Um, and so anyway, I'm not going to like tell too much more about what happens there because, um, the, you know, the school teacher wants to give him a more normal life, um, tar water. Anyway, I am botching the plot of this. I know that, sorry, cause I was distracted. And anyway, so it's a classic. It's Flannery O'Connor. Like I said, I like this much better than Wise Blood. The descriptions of people with disabilities. The book was written in 1960. It's not going to be as PC as it is as we are accustomed to. The child is referred to as a dimwit, uh, I believe a, a, on multiple occasions. He's referred to as an idiot, um, I believe. And so reading this, you have to know that that is the language from the times. So anyway, it's unfortunate that that was, that's what it is. We've evolved since then, still have a ways to go, uh, with that. And yeah, so, um, I think that, you know, after reading Flannery O'Connor's two novels, I feel like her short stories are better, um, at least for me. And yeah, so Anyway, so that, that is my, oh, and one thing I wanted to show you with this is, so it is, um, you know, it's from 1960 and it's from my daughter's library, but check it out. It has the date due stamps on the back cover. And like some of these dates are just like amazing. It is the, like the first one is April 29th, 1965. And there is also another like, April 3rd, 1967, and, you know, April 29th, 1969. I was three weeks old at that point. So anyway, I think I'm giving that four stars. So what do I have coming up? So I have a couple books out that are, um, that are on the booker list. And one of them, uh, I believe, and two that are on Barack Obama's reading list and so they're both out from the library they're all out from the library so i'm thinking i probably have to get to them sooner because they are going to be um in, in more demand so the first book i have is small things like these by claire keegan and um you know this is i don't really know too much about this only that it's a very short book it would be a great book for Shorty September, um, but I think I'm going to actually start this tonight and maybe finish it because it is only about like a hundred and like 17 pages or something like that, 116 pages. I also have Mouth to Mouth by Antoine Wilson. Um, that was also on Barack Obama's summer reading list. So I've seen this on um, Karen's channel from Roving Reader. And so interested in this. And finally, Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. Um, another one that was on the Barack Obama's list. I think that Small Things Like Us was on the Booker, was on one of the Booker Prize list. So Anyway, um, so those are the reads I also have on my Kindle, um, The Warmth of Other Suns, which is my current uh, big book um, for Sue Jackson's uh, Big Book Summer Challenge. Anyway, so those are the books that I have to, wanted to tell you about. Let me see if I can do the old holding them up for you. And yeah, so anyway, I hope you are having a great summer with great reading and I will, I would love to hear what you are reading if you've read any of these books and let me know in the comments or just leave me an emoji. And if you haven't already, would love for you to subscribe um, to my channel and I look forward to talking to you again soon in my next video real soon. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye.